I have been debating whether or not to share my experience. I do not tell people because no one would believe me. My experience is chilling, strange, unexplainable, and hard to believe. It sounds fake, in fact, even though I am a believer in the paranormal, if someone shared this story with me, I would not believe them. It was truly unusual. I was about 27 years old when this took place. I have had the life experience of knowing both residents and members of staff in mental health hospitals. I have been observing them long enough to know what move they will make before they make it. My intuition is stronger than ever. I knew what would happen before it happened on these fateful winter nights of 1993. I could tell by their body language what they were saying. But what I do not know is who else knows. That creeps me out to this day, as I know I am not alone in knowing. I have lived in hospitals on and off all my life. I know all there is to know and I know when something is amiss. I had been at High Taunton Hospital since 1988. I was there for a little over five years on and off. The hospital is made up of buildings constructed in the year of 1871. It's common knowledge to all the residents of High Taunton Hospital this was previously known to have been a workhouse back in the day. It has an eerie feeling about the place. When you walk into the building, you feel like you are being watched. I always did whilst I was there. I was living amongst the long white corridors that conceal the whispering secrets and gossip of Welbeck Ward in the winter of 1993. This is the first time I am telling the story of these most unfortunate events. Never in my life have I ever known such radical behaviors from a staff member and two residents. I mean to plan a murder. That's something else. It's not something you usually hear about in these places. I know I've been here. I am now living with the said three. I look over my shoulder every day hoping they do not find out my secret, like I found out theirs. I have never really gotten over the multiple deaths that occurred in the month of December 1993. Wendy was married to Edward Taylor. She was a freelance journalist on the scent of an exclusive about three people at High Taunton Hospital. The investigation is about three women called Angela, Shirley, and Sheila. Shirley is a member of staff at the High Taunton Hospital and Angela and Sheila are residents. They both have learning disabilities and have been living there for some time as they require a lot of support and help. Shirley is their main key worker. Wendy was investigating Shirley as she has a jaded past. Wendy was investigating all three of them as they have been up to no good. For example, they were known to be stealing from other staff and patients. They basically ran the ward. The rest of the staff and residents were too scared to say anything against them. They controlled people's ability to have days out, what support they had, what activities they could do, making other people's lives difficult. The three of them had got wind of Wendy's investigation as they had seen Wendy's picture in the local paper. Wendy and Edward had a heated discussion on the night of March 3, 1993. It was a thundery night the sky was as black as a raven's feather. There was something eerie in the atmosphere. As she was so focused on her work and was always writing about the three people in question, and Wendy had been doing this for some time now, Edward and Wendy faced some troubles in their relationship and Edward wanted a divorce. He arrived home from work on this faithful night with the papers in hand. Wendy, sign these papers, he shouted as he waved them around with rage. Wendy looked up at him in surprise. Wendy stammered, what, what, what you want about? Sign the divorce papers. Wendy, you have been doing this exclusive for the last six months. You have had no time for me. But this is my work, Edward. I have to do this. People need to know what's going on. The subject became quite heated, causing Wendy to spiral out of control. She was crying hysterically and shouting at Edward. During the argument, Wendy had gotten so angry that she threatened Edward to the point that she attacked him. 
Edward managed to call the authorities to have Wendy sectioned due to the risk she posed him and others including herself. She continued to shout at him. Wendy was pleading with him not to call the authorities. She screamed I a three months pregnant Edward dropped the phone. But it was too late the authorities had already been contacted. Wendy was exclaiming you asshole. I'm pregnant. On that fateful night of March 3rd, 1993, Wendy was admitted to High Taunton Hospital. Little did Wendy know, she had prying eyes watching her as she entered through the doors. These prying eyes were that of Sheila, Shirley, and Angela. Being top dogs on the ward, the said three had eyes and ears everywhere, so they knew that little Miss Wendy Investigator Taylor was due to arrive upon Welbeck Ward within the hour. As Wendy was admitted, she was still exclaiming to the staff, I'm three months pregnant, let me go. Once Wendy had calmed down, she was given a pot to provide a urine sample to see if what she was saying was true and to see if she had taken any illegal substances to explain her erratical behavior. After Wendy provided the pot of urine containing her truth, the next step was for Wendy to have a wash. She was ordered to the bath chambers where the middle bath had already been drawn for her. She slunk into the hot water and replayed the events of earlier this evening, but through all the commotion, she could still not pull her thoughts away from her work, from her investigation, from the said three. They were here, she was here, so she knew she had to continue with her investigation, secretively. Shirley in particular had started to have an interest in Wendy, not just in her work but into her personal life. Shirley knew Wendy was a tailor, but now she knew which tailor she was. Wendy was a tailor of Edward Taylor from Derby. The Edward Taylor of Derby who was a teacher by day, the Edward Taylor who was teacher by day and cult leader by night. The Edward Taylor that Shirley had once loved, Shirley dated Edward about three years previously in 1990. I can tell you it was not a positive relationship. Edward used to be part of a cult. This cult specialized in black magic that they cast on innocent people. Edward had cast a curse on Shirley. She knew too much about his work in the cult and she asked too many questions. This curse caused her to go insane and she suffered from hallucinations that she believed to be real. Shirley nearly ended up being hospitalized, however she went to see a witch doctor who lifted the curse. Shirley ended the relationship with Edward and decided to look into work in mental health and started her career as a support worker in High Taunton Hospital. As was mentioned earlier, Shirley later became the main key worker for Angela and Sheila. Angela and Sheila took to Shirley like ducks to water. They became close friends and followed her everywhere. They could always be seen together. Shirley first realized that Wendy was the wife of Edward when Wendy was admitted to High Taunton Hospital as Edward came with her and her newly appointed social worker. When Shirley first spotted Edward, she froze, gasped, and went pale as if she had seen a ghost. Angela and Sheila were worried about her and did not understand her reaction as they had never seen her like that. Shirley takes the two somewhere private to explain to them who Edward was and who that meant Wendy was. The three decided then to get back at Edward through Wendy, but also to get back at Wendy for her investigation. Wendy had been encouraged to sign the divorce papers and the divorce was now in process. Wendy's pot of truth was ready for its big reveal. There was no surprise for Wendy when the results showed negative for any consumption of drugs. She was soon shook out of her calm state, however, when it also showed a negative for pregnancy. Wendy was distraught about the pregnancy results. She had honestly believed she had been pregnant for three months because she had not had her period. However, she never thought to take a test. She just hoped for the best as she had experienced other symptoms of pregnancy like aches and morning sickness. Wendy had always wanted a baby, however, had never had the opportunity to hold or even touch one before. 
She wasn't a warm and welcoming woman, had little friends and people didn't trust her around their children. The doctors diagnosed her with a phantom pregnancy. Due to these results, Wendy spiraled into a depression. Through counseling and research, the doctors found that alongside her depression, she also displayed symptoms of a personality disorder. These, however, were not something Wendy had ever shown prior to night of March 3, 1993. Perhaps they had worsened with the depression and her divorce and loss of hope for having a baby. Perhaps. The doctors ultimately decided to keep Wendy in hospital. This was found to be much to the delight of the said three. Wendy has been staying in the hospital for three weeks now. Surely Sheila and Angela had been making her life difficult whilst she had been there. Once they had found out that Wendy was not pregnant and how this had affected her due to her need for a baby, they found it useful to torment her by telling her that Angela has had a child and that all of them have had many opportunities to hold babies, taunting her saying that she would never get that chance. Wendy had become very jealous of Angela and the others. She used this jealousy to fuel her anger and bullied other patients and staff alike. Wendy started to attack people, pulling their hair, slapping their faces. She also started to get an obsession with clothes and would steal other people's clothes. The said three were starting to have enough of Wendy's attitude. Although they had been planning her demise from the minute she entered the hospital, Wendy had become far more irritating and demanding of others. She would demand staff members to make her coffees residents to give her their food, even after she had finished all of her own. She was never satisfied, she always wanted more. Her temper fuse was short and explosive, seemed strange for once a woman of patience. One afternoon, the residents of High Taunton Hospital were in the communal area doing a group activity where they were making clothes with the OT. I was on the sewing machine, this is when I witnessed Sheila grab Wendy by her hair, pulling her up from the chair, and she dragged her around the room before discarding her to the floor with ease. Angela took her turn and said to Wendy, it serves you right, slapping Wendy's face. Wendy pulled herself up off the floor as nobody came to her aid. Sheila then slapped Wendy across the face also, telling her I'm gonna bang you one. Shirley responded to the incident in an act of trying to disguise her hatred for Wendy from anyone other than her friends. She made it look like she was going to see if Wendy was all right, but really she was goading her emotions further into darkness. How could you be so selfish upsetting two vulnerable people who are just as frustrated as you living here? You are not helping. Lowering her voice to a level of loathing you'll get yours, Wendy Taylor. Shirley went and hugged Angela and Sheila, consoling them and taking them out of the room. Wendy was left there with the OT and the remaining residents. Although on this occasion, Wendy hadn't done anything to deserve the abuse she received from Sheila and Angela, she was blamed by the OT based on what everyone already knew about Wendy's attitude towards the said three and increasingly the other residents and staff members of High Taunton. The OT explained that Sheila and Angela have special needs and need a lot of support and that Wendy needs to stop winding them up. The OT then also said to Wendy that if her behavior continued, she would no longer be allowed to attend these activities with everyone else. Life in the hospital is no walk in park. You see things, you hear things, things that would not happen anywhere else. Many nights I have lay in bed the walls they whisper, they whisper of evil plots and death. I know their secrets, I know what they are going to do, I have had nightmares about it. I know it's not only me who knows of this dark future for Wendy, but in a place like this you do not say anything to no one. I rue the day until I can leave, until I can get out this place, but some people never leave, they only leave in boxes. In a mental health hospital, Life is like a game of chess. You really must know what steps to take to stay in game. One wrong move can seal your doom. 
In the case of this tale, the favors are with those of the said three. Wendy's game is almost over. The said three will seal her fate. The spring rolled through high Taunton like a breeze, but the summer of 93 heated up in more ways than one. The women of Welbeck Ward were fighting a lot, cat fights here, nasty comments there. Sheila and Angela wouldn't leave Wendy alone, and she was just as bad. Both sides of this war on the ward had been doing their homework, and Wendy had discovered a link to Shirley, the link that is Edward Taylor. She had overheard the said three talking in the corridor one afternoon. The rest of us residents didn't find out what Wendy knew until another incident occurred on August 3rd. We were all having tea when Sheila and Wendy had a blazing row. It had been bubbling or a few weeks Sheila was in a bad mood as Shirley had told her to clean her pots away. Sheila didn't like this, she didn't like Shirley treating her like all the other residents when she knew that they were so much more than that. Sheila couldn't contain her anger anymore and picked a fight with Wendy. Wendy's emotions were also heightened as her patience had grown even thinner as she had not received the coffee she had ordered from the staff in the kitchen. Wendy was stood at the hatch when Sheila shouted across the room to her Wendy, you ugly cow. Wendy flipped and saw red and the two women started brawling, the worst I had ever seen. It was animalistic. Shirley tried to intervene by placing Wendy in a restraint hold to remove her from the room. Feeling victimized by the said three yet again in a situation in front of the other residents, Wendy broadcasted parts of Shirley's past in front of everyone. I know about your phantom pregnancy, hey Shirley. Your ex-boyfriend, the one who cursed you, he is the man I am now, divorcing Shirley's face turned red with anger. Then Sheila and Angela looked surprised at Wendy. Shirley dragged Wendy from the dining room forcing her into the living room next door where she knew nobody was and proceeded to strangle Wendy. Wendy, still filled with rage and bigger than Shirley, used her strength to rip Shirley's hands off from around her neck and pushed her to the floor. At this moment, Sheila walks in, sees Red and launches herself at Wendy in a retaliation for attacking and announcing Shirley's life. That's it said, surely she has been within our reaches for the last nine months, and that woman is still breathing. Tonight we do it. It's time the last six months had been meticulous planning from the said three. The direction of each camera was known, the route of patrol by the security on duty was recorded, staff members would be administering other residents' medications, doing the nightly checks and filling in paperwork. The said three had it all narrowed down to a 33-minute window. It is December 3rd, 1993, nine months exactly after Wendy Taylor was first admitted to High Taunton Hospital. Tonight was also a thundery night, as black as the shadows of nightmares. Tonight's full moon had an effect on all the patients of High Taunton Hospital. People were running around screaming, taking over the hospital, the staff were outnumbered. The said three were going to hang Wendy on June 6, 1994, but they had had enough and decided to bring their plans forward and couldn't have expected such a disguise. The said three had time and a cover to get everything ready. Tonight was the perfect night. It was as if the residents knew and their crimes could be hidden within the chaos. Wendy's fate was sealed. Shirley uses her position as a support worker to Wendy's disadvantage. In the chaotic atmosphere of the full moon effects, she sees Wendy in the crowds and tackles her to the ground using a restraint hold for such circumstances. Sheila and Angela look on from afar and are in awe of Shirley's initiative as it looks like nothing more than a patient out of control kicking back against the authority. However, these signs of a struggle are real and Wendy was fighting for air. She couldn't breathe as Shirley was pinning her down so hard against the floor she was crushing her lungs. Wendy went limp. This was it. 
They dragged her away to the bath chambers without anybody noticing. They arrived at the bath chambers where they would silence Wendy for good. The noose was there hanging from the rafters. Wendy starts to come round from her cause of unconsciousness and sees the said three she slapped surely across the face as hard as she could. She felt she was driven with an instinct to go for Shirley and not the other two. Before Wendy had time to conjure up any, any more strength to fight back, it was the beginning of the end. Shirley kicks the chair out from underneath Wendy's feet. By 3.03 a.m. the hospital was quiet, deathly quiet. Wendy died on the 3rd of December 1993, that fateful night the said three all had a photo taken together in the bath chambers. Once the photo had been developed the next day after the murder they saw, there was a creepy hand around Sheila's shoulder. A hand they could not explain, but this would not be the only thing to happen that was left unexplained after this night. They had argued frantically about what to do with the body this was the part of the plan they hadn't completely got all the details for, as they knew they only had a certain period of time before other people would know they were missing from their beds and surely from her shift. They had to get other people involved. Shirley phoned Chad the porter for the kitchens. She knew she could trust him to come and collect the body ASAP as Chad had done time in prison with Shirley's brother. They arrived just by the skin of their teeth, to get Wendy's lifeless body packaged away in the back of a car. Shirley agreed to pay them to dispose of what once was Wendy Taylor by burning the body. Shirley was also paying for their silence. The next morning, the morning team of Welbeck Ward discovered that Wendy was gone, not seen that day her parents were notified and search parties were formed to find her. Shirley phoned Chad right away to make sure that he had completed his mission, but his wife answers. Shirley asked in a panicked voice, where is Chad? His wife replied, he died in a car crash last night. His car crashed into a ditch and the police were called to the scene. The bodies have been taken to the morgue, chalking on these words, distraught she hung up. Shirley looked as white as a ghost. Bodies? She knew she had to act fast. It wouldn't take the coroners long to identify the other body in the car was the person they were all looking for. She had to speak with Angela and Sheila. They needed to create a new plan to get rid of Wendy once and for all. But before she could get to the other two to tell them what had happened, the phone rings. Ironically, Shirley was called to come and identify the second body from the scene, along with Wendy's mom and dad. They confirmed the identification. Shirley acted distraught. She comforted Wendy's parents. How touching. All seemed to be normal for the rest of that week. High taunt in life continued as usual. But the week following, three residents died mysterious deaths. On the 10th of December, the undertakers were called and straight away many questions were asked. How did they all die? An answer nobody had. Who was the last person to see them alive? An answer nobody had. Were the deaths an accident? An answer nobody had. What could have caused the terrified expression frozen on all the victims? An answer nobody had. All the staff were interviewed one by one, including Shirley. Inspector Deuce was conducting the inquiry from the office of Welbeck Ward. He was a method detective, and he needed to be close to the mysteries occurring at High Taunton to make sure nothing else slipped away unexplained like the incidents that staff and residents alike were finding indescribable but most importantly to feel the vibe, to close this case. Inspector Deuce had Shirley in for questioning where were you on the night of the 3rd December, the night of Wendy's murder. Shirley replied I was with Sheila and Angela. They were scared of all the commotion that was going off, you know from the full moon. 
So we were having dinner in Angela's room, so they felt safe away from the pandemonium. The inspector's suspicions was that the women in front of him, previously besotted with the victim's husband, and her disciples had been planning the demise of Wendy Taylor from the night they saw her. He just had to prove it. Can anybody else vouch for your whereabouts on this night, Ms. Bowness? Yes, there is one person who can vouch for us Prudence Lace. I was lying on my bed, as I do when Julie came to fetch me. I got up and said, Are you okay, Julie? Yes, thank you, Prudence. The inspector would like a word with you, though. Please come with me. I wasn't expecting that. I thought I was in some kind of trouble with Rob the staff nurse. That's usually why Julie comes to fetch me. As I walked down the corridors, I couldn't help but wonder why the inspector had asked for me. He was only interviewing the staff members. Hi, Inspector Deuce, I said in a quivering voice as I knocked on the door of the office. You wanted to see me. With a gentle demeanor, sensing my nervousness, the inspector invited me to come and sit. Would you like a cup of tea, Prudence? I have bourbon biscuits, he said, offering me the tin and a chair which I accepted. He made me feel at ease. He was a kind man. He started by asking me about the day-to-day -day running of High Taunton Hospital, about staff members, their professionalism, what I thought of them, how they seemed with the residents. Then he started asking me these questions about Shirley. How does Shirley appear to you, her behavior towards residents? She has the best interests at heart. She's a good worker. She would put her own life on the line for them. She does wear her heart on her sleeve. I said. Who's them Prudence? And Miss Sheila and Angela. Why would she put her life on the line for them? Because she is their key worker, and she has the best interests at heart, like for all of us. She has just recently had a promotion to senior nurse. Why would she put her life on the line for those two over everyone else, do you think? No, I didn't say that, Inspector. She would put her life on the line for all of us. She is a really good member of staff. I'm sorry, Prudence, I misunderstood you. Do you think Shirley would have put her life on the line for Wendy? I paused. I looked into the inspector's eyes. Yeah, she would put her life on the line for all of us. I knew this wasn't true, but I had to say this. I had to say this to save my own life. Another week passed by typically on the ward. Naturally, there were a lot of grieving staff. Many seemed to be upset by the sordid affair. Even though Wendy wasn't the most liked, you noticed her presence was missing. They were all trying to find ways to overcome these feelings, as we all do in life when these feelings come our way. On the 17th December, three more residents died of mysterious deaths. This heightened emotions for everyone on the ward and there was a lingering feeling of fear dot 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 who would be next. The grounds you walk around within High Taunton Hospital are creepy enough as it is. Suffice to say, the unexplained deaths were making it worse than that, even more haunting. One more week went by on 24th of December, three more residents died tallying the total body count to nine mysterious deaths, all from High Taunton Hospital all from the Welbeck Ward. This was more than a coincidence. With no leads and no evidence, everyone was a suspect. These final three deaths would be the last mysteries to occur at High Taunton following the death of Wendy Taylor. The said three felt like they were being watched. They would hear shuffling footsteps in the hallways wherever they went. They were all touched at different times on the shoulders. They would feel the sensation of being shoved, stroked, scratch dot 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 but by unseen hands one account of a male nurse peter orchard also felt an invisible hand on his shoulder to and from work surely felt like she was being followed especially at night one evening she received an anonymous call who whispered down the crackling line you are being watched 
and you were on December 3rd, Shirley drops the phone. The next day, reeling from the phone call, still, Shirley needs to speak to Angela and Sheila away from the eyes and ears inside the walls of Welbeck Ward. Angela, Shirley, and Sheila had a walk around the grounds and before they knew it their feet had guided their way to the bath chambers. They couldn't believe what they had seen Wendy. In the middle bath, wrapped in a clear body bag, her face that resembled the Black Dahlia. Which freaked the said three even more. They had a heated discussion about what to do with the body, why don't we burn it once and for all, then there is no chance of it coming back to haunt us. I know where there is a shoot we can take the body there, said Shirley. They continued to walk to the main building, going through the entrance near the kitchens. Once they entered the building, they took the lift and Wendy's body to the top floor where the chute was, next to the sewing room. They dragged the body through the corridors, leaving the stench of death trailing behind them, but the footsteps of someone else besides them. They shoved the body in the chute, where it descended to the incinerator. They heard the roaring flames like thunder swallowing Wendy whole. They hugged each other in relief, and they said together she is gone. They weren't at ease for long, when they heard a disembodied bone-chilling scream echoing through the corridors. They legged out of the building as fast as you could run, hand in hand. Although completely shaken by the whole ordeal, they knew they had to act as if nothing were amiss. They grabbed some towels and a change of clothes as they were planning on having a bath to stage a cover-up of what they had really been up to. Back at the bath chambers, all three got into a tub. Shirley was in the middle bath, big mistake. The said three finished scrubbing themselves and then the chambers of Wendy's DNA and returned back to the ward telling the tale to everyone that they had just been swimming as not to raise suspicion to themselves. They had to know that Wendy and her ghost were now gone for good and that they were in the clear. They went snooping around Inspector Deuce's office. The report became apparent that the coroners at the morgue knew it was a death by hanging and that it didn't appear to be a suicide due to the bruises, scratches, and newly developed scars all over her body and that they were inflicted moments before her last breath. Shirley learned the following from reading the report. This was not Wendy's first time in High Taunton. She had been sectioned previously in 1985. When she was told to bath on arrival, Wendy had levitated above the middle bath. The staff hot tailed out of there and reported this to the matron, who called the priest to come ASAP. They thought she was possessed, so then Father John exorcised Wendy. After the exorcism, they found there to be no demon inside of Wendy Taylor. What they did discover was that she was a witch. Quote, unquote, stated on the 3rd December 93, only hours before her death, Wendy said she would make the said three pay. After Shirley had read the report, she was as ashen as if she had seen the ghosts of her past and her future. She had found out far more than she bargained for. That very night before her death, Wendy had made a pact with the devil to sell her soul. She could sense her death coming and knew she had to do something about it. She had to protect herself, even in death. She signed a contract in her own blood using a fountain pen and sold her soul to the devil. The contract had a drawing of the devil himself on it. Needless to say, the devil would exact the gruesome revenge on the said three. It came to light that Wendy was too late selling her soul and it had been done in vain as the said three sold theirs to the devil first in return they would buy Wendy's soul. In the meantime, the said three were still being followed and taunted. The lights on the ward flickered. The TV would turn on by itself and doors would randomly slam shut. Sheila and Angela would see a dark shadowy figure looming in the nights. While Shirley was working on a sleep on the ward one night, she was dropping off while reading reports. In the office, the dark figure was looming over her too. 
it was undoubtedly Wendy's silhouette. The next day loads of crows were seen around the grounds and I filmed them and put them in slow mo -o. Over the course of the next few days, people who worked at the hospital went missing into the woods and beach. People were running away from High Taunton. Three kids from the community surrounding the hospital vanished. Her power was growing and kids were also being haunted. Those who had been found alive told us what they saw. The story was always the same. At the end of the hallways and at the end of beds, they would see a black mass and then a ghostly apparition blood dripping down the walls, and hear high-pitched screams. During vast hunts at the beach, Shirley discovers photographs accounting for Wendy's movements right up to moments after her death. Had she found these by accident, or had the mysterious caller from before placed them in her line of sight? There are photos of residents pulling her hair, including the incident with Sheila. There is one of Wendy signing her divorce papers and one of her looking out of one of the older buildings at High Taunton. There were also photos of High Taunton's entrance, photographs of Wendy smoking just moments in her life that had been captured. There was also the captured moment of her death. Remember the photo in the bath chambers of the said three on December 3rd? Well, on a closer inspection, there was a mysterious hand in the background that had not been seen before that looked like it was on Sheila's shoulder. A parcel arrives on Shirley's doorstep that night. She didn't see who it was, they were gone by the time she reached her door. It was a VHS tape. Every incident involving Wendy was on that tape, all the cat fights and the shady going-ons, everything the said three had done had all been recorded. But by who? Who had sent this to Shirley? Who knew all of Wendy Taylor's death? Shirley saw an apparition of the Grim Reaper in the corridor who she thought was Wendy Taylor, but she couldn't be sure. Shirley saw again the shadow of the Grim Reaper in the grounds this time she knew it to be the spirit of Wendy Taylor. Even with her hair covering her face, she was peering at Shirley through the gap in her hair, peering right into her soul. In her living years, Wendy smoked due to stress of living in a hospital and her sadness of not having a baby. The smell of smoke is still often noticed wafting the vents inside the ward. Sometimes people can see a mist of smoke accompany the presence of this smell. There is an unmarked grave with a crow beside it where Wendy was going to be buried. The chute was sealed off a day later with police tape do not cross, and to this day is still there. The said three and the grim reaper have not been seen since. Hospital life was rather like a game of chess. You had to know what moves to take. I guess the said three and Wendy had been playing a game of chess, and this game ended in stalemate. 